Father, you have done it all. You have done everything required, God, for life and godliness, God, for life and life abundant, for eternal life, God. You have set us all free. Father, you've done that through your blood. You've done that through your all-sufficient sacrifice, God. And so all praise and glory goes to you, Father. All eyes, man, to you. All hearts, uh, God, they all belong to you, Father. And so we lift our hearts to you today, God. Would you guide us in a time of study in your word? Send your spirit that we might uh, get knowledge, but in our getting of knowledge, get understanding of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, please sit down and open in your Bibles uh, to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians again this morning as we continue our verse-by-verse study through the book. Chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, which is the precursor to chapter 13. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> chapter 13 is probably one of the most impactful, important, critical, essential chapters of the Bible because it, un, uh, it unrolls love for us. Uh, love rolled up in this you know, complex picture and then it just unrolls it and shows it to us. So I'd encourage you to read ahead for next week. 1 Corinthians 12, the remainder of the chapter, verses 12 to the end, it's not rocket science. I mean, what we're going to cover this morning is pretty clear, uh, right on its face. I mean, anybody could read through it and understand very uh, quickly what Paul is trying to say. Um, And so uh, you will have no problem understanding this portion of Scripture, and yet there's even uh, some things that God has shown me that I am privileged to share with you this morning. I also want to encourage you uh, to continue to pray about uh, the building. We are finally approved through all of our permits. I know, God is so good. you know, last week, last week when I uh, was on the way to uh, church, 12 stoplights. I go through 12 stoplights to get here. I know, you're like, how do you know that? Because I'm crazy. If y'all don't know me, I'm out of my mind. Nine out of 12 were red last week. <laughs> this is why I don't have hair. Because <laughs> this kind of stuff drives me crazy. Nine out of 12 were red last week. And last week was, you know, we were a week overdue in getting our permit. I mean, our permits should have been approved already. And so I'm like, come on, what is the holdup? Everything takes longer than it needs to take. Um, And then the permits get approved this week. And today on my way to church this morning, 11 out of 12 lights were green. (laughs) And so I'm like, God, you are so funny. Why you play with me like that? You know, (laughs) why you do that? But uh, maybe that's encouraging to you. You might in a place where things are just slow. Um, the, the delivery, the deliverance that God is going to give you is not here yet. Uh, but man, one more week perhaps. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I absolutely love this chapter. Paul started last week by talking about spirituals. Remember that? Very important conversation last week. If you weren't here, please go on the app or website and, and read up or hear, listen up on that because I want you to understand the difference between spiritual gifts and the manifestations of the Spirit is very important because if we understand the correct operation of the Holy Spirit in the church biblically, then we can identify when the Holy Spirit is and is not moving in a church. And we can keep ourselves from confusion, but we can also uh, keep the enemy from what he wants to do. And that is keep as many people with hard hearts towards his word and towards his spirit. That's what the enemy wants to do, is want want as many hard hearts as possible. And the abuse of the manifestations of the spirit, because folks just simply don't know the word of God, um, has contributed greatly to that. So please, please, please pick that up uh, from last week. This week, uh, we talk about the unity in the church. Look at chapter 12, verse 12. Again, not rocket science. Um, And so we'll we'll take this bit by bit. Uh, It says there in verse 12, For as the body is one, remember the church there in Corinth had divisions and factions. The word uh, was factions, right? People that were dividing away. Paul says, for as the body is one, this body, the body, your body, as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. The word one is used three times in that simple statement. And it's for us to realize that within the confines of the church, the Corinthian church and our church, that we are a body. And so we have, we all have different, you know, there's different members, there's different folks, but it's one body. And it's the same with the church at the universal level. You proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We're one. You believe in uh, the resurrection of Jesus, bodily resurrection. We're one. And so we might do things differently and we might look differently, but we ought to remember that uh, very important fact here that we're one. We need to remember that between Calvary chapels, uh, if you ask me. I mean, we need to remember um, that there are no superstars or, or stuff like that. We are one. There's no church more important than any other church. Every church is important um, and every church is filled with uh, the body of Christ. Verse 13, 
For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Now that is not water baptism. That is spiritual baptism. That happens at the moment anybody gets saved. Anybody opens their heart to Jesus Christ and asks for um, him to come into your life, uh, that is a spiritual baptism. In other words, the Holy Spirit takes you by the hand because that's where he is. He's on the outside. He takes you by the hand and he walks you into Jesus. You and Jesus folding in together. That's a spiritual immersion and that's what he's talking about here. He says, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Four times, I want you to understand this, four times in the Bible, the church is called the body of Christ. Now this is interesting, because it's only called, the church is only called the body of Christ by Paul. This is like one of Paul's, you know, have you ever, um, well, many of you have, gone to teach a Bible study, and God just gives you something you've never heard before, and it is so good, and it's so powerful, and then you use it a thousand times for the rest of your life. It's happened to me a lot, you know? I think this is one of Paul's, like, crowning revelations that God gave to him. It's not given in James. It's not given by what John wrote. Uh, It's not given in the Gospels. It's given only by Paul. This revelation of the quote-unquote body of Christ. And it is brilliant, because the body, and Paul is going to go into this more in just a moment, but the body has different parts, and all of the different parts of the body, and see, this isn't rocket science, but it all makes sense and is applicable to the church as well. And that's what Paul is trying to say to Corinth. The body made up of different parts, different members, and all of the different parts have different functions. They look different. They have different capabilities. They have different usages. And yet, both outwardly and inwardly, outwardly, even though it's all different, and inwardly, even what we cannot see, it is all, the body, your body, is all unified together as one. Or we should be, or the body should be, lest there be cancer in the body. Cancer is just a a clump of cells doing their own thing, not being unified and not supporting the head as it were. Remember, Jesus is the head of the church. And if he is the head and he is the shot caller, then these things, we ought to be unified. But there's great difficulty in being unified because that means our flesh has to be choked out sometimes. Our flesh has to be dealt with. And so there's great difficulty in this, but we need to understand what the truth is. Every part of the body, every part, built put together differently, quite differently. You might know this. I'm not a doctor like Dr. Oster about. I love that. Out. I love it. Love how he talks. I'm not a doctor, and I didn't. I, I don't put these things together unless I unless I go and I and I look into these things. Every part of your body, although is very different, all has the same root code. Every bit of me has the same DNA. Whether you take it from my finger, from my toe, from my knee, from my you know shoulders, or ridiculously strong biceps. It all. Come on, RT. It all has the same DNA structure. And so whether you take it from this movement that the, you know, was done through John Wesley years ago, or you take it from this movement that was done through Chuck Smith years ago, we should all be cut. We should all have the same DNA. We should all have the same root code. And those people across the aisle from you and in the back to the front, man, it's all the same root code. The body is in a remarkable, remarkable invention. I didn't know this, but on a genetic level, I just want to give you a couple things that blow my mind about the human body, which is also applicable to the church body. On a genetic level, everyone in this room, everyone on this earth is more than 99% identical. Does that not blow you away? And we have such issues with people, don't we? You know what you have issues with? 1% of that person. (laughs) Because I am 90, you know, if I've got an issue with you, I need to recall that you and I are the exact same. 90, no matter where we're from, no matter what our heritage or pedigree, 99% every human being is identical. I think that's wild. I also didn't know that your bones are stronger than concrete. The bones together, the molecular structure, how God has invented this in the body of Christ, the skeletal structure, stronger, we should be. But your bones right now, stronger than concrete. And every day, your heart circulates your blood through your body about a thousand times. It's amazing to think about that. There, there, there will be a test afterwards, so pay attention. That's why I'm giving you these. There's no end, in my opinion, to the wonder of the body. If you lay end to end all of the blood vessels in the human body, just you, just your human body, if you lay all the blood vessels end to end, you will go around the planet four times. 
just you. Doesn't that blow your mind? What that says to me is, although we can see so much that goes on in our bodies and we can see so much in the church body, there are intricacies and facts and pieces of the design that are just mind-blowing. You see it? And, and I don't even know these things are going on. I don't tell my blood vessels to go vessel. Go vessel today, you know, vessel up, you know. It just happens, man. And there's a wonder that goes on in the body of Christ that Paul is trying to say and trying to reveal to the church in Corinth who's dividing and things like that. You're killing it, man. You're not doing what you ought to do. A hundred thousand chemical reactions occur in the human brain every second. A hundred thousand a second chemical reactions in the human brain. Fifty thousand cells in your body died and were replaced by new ones while you listened to this sentence. Doesn't that blow you away? I'm just, you're like, yeah, what? You're, but that blew me away. Why am I going through this? Because I got blinded with science. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. I found out you're taller in the morning than you are at night. I always knew I was a morning person for some reason. <laughs> here's, the, here's the last one. I thought this was really, really good. Humans are the only species with a chin. Uh. <laughs> I thought that was great. <laughs> We're the only ones that get chin. Yay, you know. <laughs> Miraculous. Some people have two. Thank you, Kyle. That's right. Some people have two. Double blessed. That's right. It's miraculous. The human body. I mean, and Paul has this revelation from heaven that the church body is just as miraculous. And Paul calls the church the body of Christ. Every part of the body, which you and I are, every part of the body, for anyone that has uh, called upon Jesus, anybody that is a Christian, although having many different capabilities and functions, all support and serve one another. Hello, James. Hello. All support. Every part of your body supports and serves a good, healthy body. Every bit of it supports and serves every bit of it. The foot supports the leg. The leg supports the midsection. The midsection supports the head. The head supports the foot. And on and on we go. Everyone knows the hip bone is connected to the? Thigh bone. Yeah, they, I thought it was thigh bone. Is it leg bone? Because them bones, them bones, man. They're going to walk around. And so all, all of this diversity, all of this difference but each part supporting one another, each part having the same root code. That helps me, man, because I see things that are different than how I would do it. And so I need to remember, man, we all have the same root code. We all have the same reason as the body of Christ. Everyone there in Corinth, all these factions and divisions, Paul is trying to remind them, don't, aren't you all here to glorify Jesus? Don't you have one single reason to be here? And only together can the parts make the body. Five legs don't make a body, right? Congratulations, it's an eyeball. <laughs> that, 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 ah! You know, that doesn't work. <laughs> Consequently, your ears and nose never stop growing, but your eyes are the same size as they were when you were born. Doesn't that blow your mind? I, hey, I read it on the internet, so it must be true. <laughs> we need all the different parts. We need all the different parts to make up the body. So Paul reveals that when you became a Christian, when you became a Christian, you took on a role. You, every person in here, took on a role, a predetermined, and we talked about this last week, gift-filled and gift-enabled role within the family of God, within the church. And you're not only gifted, but I want you to hear this from me. And you may not believe me because you may say, I don't do much. I'm going to address you specifically in a minute. And you're going to be encouraged. You are needed and you are important here. Essential to proper, whoever you are, if you belong to Jesus Christ and this is your church home, I want you to know that you are essential to proper church operation. You may not feel that way, but when did faith ever become about feelings? When faith became about feelings, religion came in and messed everything up. It's not about feelings. This is what the truth is. This is the body of Christ. It might give you pause when I say that. I, you might say, I don't know what I'm called to do. Look, man, sometimes, and this is, this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release some of you, and I'm going to challenge some of you. All right? Sometimes you're just called to be skin. Holding things together through encouragement. You know encouragement holds a church together? People that leave churches and don't come back are because they're not encouraged there. Maybe you're just called to pray for someone. Maybe it's just your presence. Are you ever just happy about your skin? Things just don't go, you know. <laughs> but it doesn't really do anything. Just here, you know. It's the biggest organ of your body. I know all the, that, that stuff. But it doesn't really do anything. 
It, but, but it holds everything together. And sometimes, sometimes your presence is extremely important. That's part of the body. Sometimes you're just called to be tissue. We have tissue in our body all over the place. It doesn't really do anything, but sometimes you need, somebody needs to just cry on someone's shoulder. Well, there's some tissue right there. You just need somebody to be your friend for the day. The body has to have both of those things, and yet neither the skin nor the tissue lifts. Well, all you doctors in the room that are going to send me emails, just don't, okay? It sounds good. Whether it's clinically correct or not, it's spiritually correct. There you go. The tissue, the the skin, these things that you think aren't are meaningless, they, they, they may not lift anything like the arm does. And if you're an arm in the room, you've gotten a little uppity when somebody hasn't helped you with something God has told you to do. They may not lift anything like the arm does. They grip no public ministry like a hand grips. But I don't want you to be discouraged if you're not called to be front and center visible ministry. You're still an essential element of the body of Christ. You're still essential, every one of you. And Paul is revealing this to the church in Corinth. But we as the church in America need to remember this. This is more so in America. We're the doers of the world. Did you know that? We're the long hour workers. We're the, kill, we, we're the student debt community, uh, what is it called? Nation. Why is that? Because everybody's got to be something and be somebody great. Well, what about the grandfather that never attained riches in this life, but man, t- took care of his family and was there when they needed a ride? You know, I mean, that's, where, where, what about that? Where's that? You're an essential element of the body of Christ, whether your skin and tissue or your hands and muscle. And Paul will go on in just a moment, but it makes sense to mention this now. He'll go on into this. You who do the heavy lifting, and we have heavy lifters, I understand. We have heavy lifters in this church. If you despise those that do not thinking that they are not ministers of the manifold grace of God because they're not putting away chairs or teaching the kiddos upstairs, then you are sorely mistaken and you need to repent. You need to repent. Stop thinking of yourself so highly. Do you know why I can speak with such authority on this? Because this is, this is my letter. You know what I'm saying? Stop thinking of yourself. If you're a heavy lifter and you do a whole lot at the church and there's a resentment in your heart towards those that aren't doing much, Stop thinking so highly of yourself. Walk in your calling. It's your calling. It's your calling, not theirs. I remember Chuck Smith used to tell a story about walking around the church building and he would pick up cigarette butts and he would get all upset that none of his staff is picking up cigarette butts and he's the one out there doing it and God corrected his heart. And God said, but I've called you to do it. I've called you to do it. And so I, I want you to, I want you to, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Let the body be the body. And this is hard to do. It's very hard. Starting this church, I, you know, April and I were the heavy lifters. Chin, there from day one, heavy lifters. We would pack the, the trailer. We would drive the trailer with my truck, which Scott called a half truck because it only had a four and a half foot bed. Um, and it probably was a half truck, but I hate him. Um, we would put the gates in there for the kids' ministries, and we'd pack the trailer. We'd come to church. We'd set up. We would do the entire church service. Everybody would leave, and we would break it all down. And we did all the heavy lifting for the church, and then people started to come along. I would do all the recording. I did all the sound. In Virginia, I did all the accounting. I did every bit of the books. We did everything. And we come out here and we're like, we're supposed to share the ministry. We're not supposed to do everything. And now, you know, fast forward, to, I, I'm, I'm walking in the door this morning and worship is already playing. And, and the lights are on and the air is on and the things booted up. And there's just a blessing in letting the body be the body. But today, if you're a heavy lifter and you're looking around going, why aren't these people, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, do, why do you think so high of yourself? Let the body be the body. Walk in your calling. God will bless that. Verse 15, Paul continues, says, if the foot should say, I've never seen a foot talk. <laughs> if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Not rocket science here. He's just basically saying, if you're a foot, be a foot. 
If you're an ear being ear, you imagine if your big toe like broke off and said, I'm tired of being down here. It's all dark and smelly, you know, and it walks up your leg and it plants itself in the middle of your thigh. Look, Madison, right here. Plant yourself. Got you. I'm going to get you later. <laughs> yeah. Put, and it plants, it plants itself right here. Then it would be like, what is that? You have a toe on your thigh. Or what if it, you know, crawled up and was like, I'm tired of being a toe. I want to be an eyeball. And, and then you had a toe right on your eye. That would be totally weird. <laughs> and your body would be defeated. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Chin left. Those jokes were so bad, Chin left. So that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, listen, man, be where God's placed you to be. be and, and, and if right now you're in a period of, well, I'm just coming and I'm just present at the church. Well, guess what? You are absolutely essential here as well. Wait on the Lord and walk in your calling. And so he continues, and he says, verse 17, If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? And that's how you know. Teenagers are supposed to be part of the body of Christ, because that is definitely where the smelling is. Especially their rooms. What is going on? Smelly. I like this, though, because it's telling me that there are people that needed a, a rhythm of ministry outside of Calvary Chapel. The rhythm of ministry here at C4 is one of, you know, um, well, I don't even know. We just do life and love the Lord. I mean, that's, that's what we want to live to make Him famous. We want to make uh, converts and Christians and disciples. That's what we're here to do. But we're just living life as well. We all work. Um, we, you know, all the leadership of this church has uh, responsibilities outside the church. And so the vibe here is we're just as desperate to be here as you. We're probably not as polished, but boy, we are diligent. Um, and at the end of the day, we just, we just love the Lord, man. And so that's the vibe you get here. Heavy discipleship, heavy accountability. Um, that's the vibe here. But maybe that's not your vibe. Maybe your vibe is you want statues and tradition. Well, you're not going to get that here. Um, and so that's okay though, because maybe we're the hearing and you want the smelling. You understand? And so it's all right. It's okay. Uh, I pray that, you know, God would bring to this church whom he has called, adding to the church daily those that might be saved. And especially those that don't know the gospel especially those that don't know the good news of Jesus, that they would come to this church and hear the good news of Jesus and be saved. Whether they become members of C4 or not, I, I, neither here nor there. But, whether, but I want them to come here and have an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. Verse 18, Paul says, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as He pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? Some folks there at the church in Corinth had decided that they weren't important because they could not speak, they could not teach, they could not perform as well as others. And the church had become, check this out, big, big statement. The church had become so much about talent that it was no longer about faith. That is what we're seeing, by the way. On, listen, if, if, if we're going to compete, they say, with what is attracting the crowds, then we are going to have to be more performance-based in our worship services. Look, man, there's a place for that. I'm okay. But I'll tell you this. Whenever talent becomes the draw, not faith, that church is dying. The church is dying. And you could have a thousand people in a church and it can be completely dead. Talent is not what draws us to ministry. It's faith. And talent should not be what, what we appreciate about church services. It should be faith. It should be the trust in the Lord. Once the church starts to go that way, they're truly lost. The body isn't in the strength of the hand. The body isn't in the power of the ear. The body isn't in the stability of the leg or the facility of the eyes. The body is all of those things. And yet without one of them, it's great difficulty. Without one, without you being here, part of this body, there is additional difficulty upon the church. Some of the most important elements of the body I've never seen. How about you? I've never seen my kidneys. If I ever had one out, I would demand to keep it. That is mine. All right? I would want to put it in a jar and you come over, we'll talk about it. It'd be great. You know? <laughs> but I've never seen it. It's an essential element of my body. I've never seen it. God gave us two. We only need one. It's so cool. I've never seen it. Some of the most vital things in a church is, are things that aren't seen. Things that go on behind the, behind the scenes where you're involved, perhaps. Some of the most fundamental factors I have heard but never seen. My stomach barks at me all the time. How about you? 
sometimes at the wrong times. You ever been in a meeting and your stomach goes off and you're like, that was, you had to like tell people, that was my stomach, you know, because you don't want that, never mind, <laughs> you know. <laughs> if God has made you a stomach, it's amazing. It's amazing what you do for the body, but you're not seen. The stomach has to, I think every three days, replenish the lining of itself or it will eat itself. I mean, the stuff going on in your body is a miraculous, but nobody sees it. I don't ever go, thanks, stomach, you made yourself. You know, I never do that. It's just functioning in the body as, as many of you. I know that the eye seems cooler. The eye seems cooler. I get it, right, to be the eyeball, you know, but the stomach is so needed. Verse 20, but now indeed, Paul continues, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no, I've never seen an eye talk. I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Do you see that? Seem to be weaker. They're not weaker. In fact, the Bible says that in the day that all things are revealed, the last shall be first. And the motivation of the heart will be the inclination of what God rewards you with for eternity. It's not going to be uh, this outward expression. And uh, honestly, parts of this are hard for me to teach through. But this, this part right here specifically, as we continue, it says, And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow uh, greater honor. And on our unpresentable parts, we have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need, but God can pose the body having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. And so a lot of that, what that means, and this is hard for me to teach, is perhaps the folks that you do see the most are the folks that need it the most, are the folks that are the weakest. There's a, a family in this church, this week specifically, I have been uh, praying uh, thankfulness towards God for. Because in the years and years and years they've been here, they have never once had an argument that's risen to church leadership level. They have never once caused any division in this church. They have never once, dealing with evil and sin in their lives, have called and involved other people. They have simply been here serving and serving and serving and serving and serving, and they are able to handle their business with God. And I am so thankful. I'm so thankful for, for folks like that. It's interesting. Many times the people that have to be front and center, up front, everybody, attention and all eyes on me, many times that's the weaker vessel. Many times. But you who just are here and you're gluing this church together with kindness and love and faithfulness and gentleness and long suffering and things like that, you know, you are so essential. And you're the one that when the, when the lights are off and I'm trying to go to sleep, you're the one that God brings to my mind and says, consider my servant such and such. And I go, thank you. God, thank you that they're there with uh, what we'll talk about a little bit later, the gift of helps. Verse 24, 5, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. If the church would care for each other, we wouldn't have the schisms, man. We wouldn't have the factions and divisions. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Each, each is as important as each. This is something that, it's hard for us to get this because we think the engine is more important than the bolt on the frame. But without the bolt on the frame, you know, what's the engine going to do? Now, if you're like me, every time you work on a car, you end up with an extra bolt. Don't worry. <laughs> You'll find out where it goes soon. <laughs> but if you drop a weight on your toe, which I've done, maybe you've done that too, does the hand get with the mouth and point and say, toe, you big dummy. Lamont, you big dummy, you know? Stay over there. No, no, no. The whole body quakes. If the body is functioning as the body should function, when one of you suffers, we all suffer. And when one of you receives honor, we rejoice. There is no part of the body independent of the other. No part of the body that's independent of the other. And if, if we would, just this church, I, I, and I'm primarily concerned with this church, if we would embrace that, if you would embrace that, let me ask you this. There is no part of the body, none of you, independent of the rest of you. If you would embrace that, let me ask you, would that make you any different? If so, 
then I want to call you to repentance in a loving way. I love you. I want y'all to be, you know, set free and I want this church to be as it ought to be. And so if you say, well, wait a minute, I'm independent, can do my own thing. Okay, uh, may I call you cancer just for a minute? If you would wake up to the fact that we are the body of Christ here to glorify God and to support and encourage each other and to work together to develop and build. If, if you were to embrace that, would you change it all? Then God is speaking to you right now. Do not refuse his voice. Allow God to work. If the body would just operate as one, if we just operated, you and me, as one, what kind of powerful testimony would that be? I remember years ago, we went to a men's retreat. It might have been our first men's retreat we went to. Uh, we went with Calvary Aurora and some other churches. I got to teach there. Tommy Schneider was there. It was wonderful. And we took like 30 guys. I can't remember. It was a huge crowd of guys. And when we got there, we all walked in together. We all stood together. And then we all knelt together and prayed for the... And I'll never forget that moment. Because we were unified. A sm much smaller church at the time. But we were so extremely unified. And somebody, you know, the haters are going to look at that, at that and say, look at that, they're, they're some sort of re, you know, regimented cult or something like that. No, we weren't any of that. We were unified. And we were working as one. And I still, to this day, have people come up to me and say, we remember your church from that men's retreat because you guys were so together. What kind of testimony would it be if you would enter lock instead of being independent of your brothers and sisters forget the testimony what kind of power would that be to the world what kind of power forget the testimony forget the show what kind of power would we have we'd have uh, as a church if i've been thinking about this a lot lately it's a little bit of a sidetrack but it's only one stanza here in my notes if is the biggest word in the world it is the biggest word ever invented and in the entire world if one day we will all meet our destiny. One day we will all meet our destiny. And in the end of it all, it will all be entirely consumed by what we did with that word. That one word. If Jesus really is the way. Your whole eternity is going to be defined by that smallest, biggest word. If. If you have given your life over to the Lord. When you meet your destiny, that word if is going to be the biggest word on the wall of heaven because it will dictate your entire eternal life. Even today, that's the biggest word ever. If, listen up, I'm going to give you something. Remember how I give you stuff that's not only good spiritually, but good professionally and good in your families? Listen to this. This is for you. Even right now, it's the biggest word. If they do what I want, then I'll be what I should be. If he loves me, then I'll be easy to deal with. If she respects me, then I will show her affection. I want to call you this morning to unconditional existence. Unconditional existence. That you are who you ought to be no matter what anyone else does or doesn't do. You are, and this is part of being in the body as well, but it's called unconditional existence. That whatever somebody does do, and that's wonderful or hurtful, or what they don't do, and that's wonderful or hurtful, doesn't matter. You are who you ought to be. Do you know what that's called? It's called character. It's called respectable, strong, solid integrity. And it is lost on someone who is so intertwined with everyone else's approval or everyone else's disapproval or everyone else's service or everyone else's non-service. Man, forget all that and be a person of integrity. So few in these last days choose this hard and narrow path. But that is the way. That is the truth and that is the life. It's an unconditional existence. Jesus had an unconditional existence. Did not matter what went on around him. He was who he was. He was going to honor the Father and he was going to live perfectly under the law. Unconditional. That's the way. Have you ever even known peace, people? Have you ever even known peace? This is how you get there. Have you ever had a moment of peace in your life? Where you're just done trying to be the skinniest, the strongest, the tallest, the biggest, the smartest. Have you ever just had a moment of peace where you're just you and you're done and that's alright? How do you get there? Unconditional existence. Decide who you are. 
and be who you are no matter what goes on around you or what they do not do and do not do. I've gotten here. I lose it from time to time. But this is where I live my life. Taking the condition, listen, taking the conditions out of your walk with Christ. No more conditions, God. I'm just going to give you my life. Good or bad, polished or poor, I'm just going to give you my life. And I'm going to wake up in a life lived for the glory of God. That is when you, that is when you grasp and experience the peace of God that Jesus promised. Peace I leave with you. How do you get it? Unconditional existence. Where do you find the strength to do that? Through the Holy Spirit. So many, maybe even you this morning, are stuck on if, like a child, unable to understand the world around them. If I get this, if he does that, if she stops this, it's it's like a child, and you don't understand the world around you. No more conditions, God. I pray this is your response to what you just learned. No more conditions. No more ifs. I don't need the ifs. I trust you. I'm awake now into a life that glorifies you. What kind of power would that be? What kind of power would that be if, if you and I could get there and just be, man, who we are by the grace of God? Verse 27, Paul says this, Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually. And that's really the central verse. That's the central statement that he's trying to make, that you are the body and you are individual. You are the body of Christ and you are individual. Even though my nose supports my mind and and all the things, my hands support my body, my hands are still hands. They still have function and they still have reason. This is the key verse that Paul is trying to say here to the church in Corinth and perhaps even I know it to us as well, that we are individuals and yet we are the body and therefore we ought to function as an individual. Function as an individual like it's all up to you. If the health of this church was all up to you, where would we be? You are to function like that and I am to function like that and we are to function as the body. Unified. So while I am functioning as the individual like it is all up to me, I am also functioning as the body. Unified. What does that mean? Unified and encouraging and supporting every other individual. That's the key piece to this whole section of what Paul is trying to teach. And then verse 28, it says this, And God has appointed these in the church. And so now that we have the body, now that we understand how we're interwoven and we work together as one body, And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Now really, that's kind of how it all started, okay? It's not a priority because God does not set man over man. Every every one of us has an equal amount of grace. Every one of us has an equal calling on our life, okay? And so this is actually chronologically, Jesus commissioned first the disciples. He says first apostles. That means he just kind of sent them out. He commissioned them. And then second in that, being filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit, they became proclaimers of God's word. And so they became prophets. That's all a prophet is. A prophet shares the word of God, the truth of God with the world. That's all a prophet is. It ain't Nostradamus. It's a speaker of the word of God because prophecy is complete within the word of God. And so he sends them out and commissions them first. And he gives them his spirit. He gives them the message, makes them prophets. And then finally it says here, the third thing is they become teachers. And so as the net is cast with the truth of the word of God, as the net is cast out, you listen, we don't have to sell the Bible. I should not have to sell salvation during a church service. I I shouldn't have to do that. It's cast the net and see what you bring in. It's just cast the net. We think all this is so hard, evangelism and teaching the word of God. I got to convince everybody that I'm right. I don't have to do that. Yeah, I don't have to convince you that I'm right. I know I'm right. (laughs) Never mind. I just cast the net. And so finally, as the net is cast out there with the prophecy, the truth of God's word, men and women are drew near to them. And as the men and women come near to the disciples, come near to the church, come near to you and me, they are taught the gospel of grace. They become teachers. And then the church booms. Verse 28 continues. Then miracles. Then gifts of healings. Helps. Helps is such a big word. This is the only time it's ever used in the Bible. Right here, it's such a great word. It's antilimposis. Antilimposis. In the Greek, it's the only time we find this word is in this verse set in this chapter it's only one time and what it means is this that you're helpful 
It's a gift. It should be in the church. In the church, we should be helpful to one another. That word also can mean this, perce- perception. It's funny today, just today, when I got here, I walk out into the lobby and the, and the mats are like this, which drives me out of my mind. And so I immediately drop down and I fix the mats and I'm like, ugh! And I actually said, I guess I'm the only one that sees this. I actually said that. And then, not a minute later, God is so good, here comes Scott with a ladder. And I'm like, what are you doing, Scott? And he goes, hey, dum-dum, the light was out. And I'm like, isn't that crazy? I didn't see the light was out. Isn't that amazing? So here I am on the floor going, only I see the carpets. And above me, there's no light because I'm stupid. (laughs) I love that. I absolutely love that. The gift of helps is that you see things that I don't see. And when you see things that I don't see and you come along and help, it's also the word for relief. Do you give people relief around you? That's the, that's the helps that should be in the church. And then he says, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all of them apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? These are all rhetorical questions because the obvious answer is no. The obvious answer is no. Not all are going to be these things. Manifest these gifts. And does that matter? Does it matter if all are not in the church apostles, teachers? Does it matter? Absolutely not. Because not all are going to have the gift of church shut down. How many people in this church stay to the very end and shut the church down? None of y'all. Because there's one person in this church that has that gift. And I'm thankful every week for it because I get to leave before the church is shut down too. But see, that's a gift. And that's okay. Not all of you need to have that. If all of you were church shutdowners, that would be a problem. You would never leave. We'd be here forever. And so, no, of course not. Nobody has, not everybody has the gifts that are, uh, these callings, and that's okay. The gift of perimeter security. You don't have that gift because that's happening right now. The, The gift of pastoral dad jokes. That's a real gift. I mean, did Adam and Eve ever have a date? No, just an apple. I'm sorry, terrible, okay. Very interesting, next one, verse 30 says this. Do all have the gift of healings? See, this is where we get into the controversy of the church. Do all have the gift of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? The obvious answer is no. The obvious answer is no. If not all Christians are given these gifts by God, if they're not all given these gifts, then does that mean that we have Christians that aren't Christian? No, absolutely not. Therefore, here's a big statement we'll get into more in chapter 14. Is speaking in tongues required for salvation? Impossible. It's impossible to make that statement, and yet so many do, and I don't know why. I don't know why. They've been taught incorrectly, and it dishonors God, and it sends people away from the cross. Verse 31 as we close. Matt, please come up as we close. But earnestly desire the best gifts. Wait a minute. You already went all through chapter 12 and all these gifts that everybody is familiar with. What what do you mean the best gifts? Are there more? And yet I show you a more excellent way. Chapter 14, Paul's going to open up and say, pursue love and desire gifts, but especially, here comes some of the best ones, that you would prophesy. Some of the best gifts. But he said before that, pursue love. All this talk about gifts, all this focus on spirituals, and yet the bedrock of anything of goodness, don't forget this, don't miss this, the bedrock of anything of goodness, anything godly, anything worth, anything eternally, the way in which, from which, and to which all of the functions of the church must be from, to, and go towards the greater, listen, I'm going to say it this way, the greater than any spiritual gift, the king, the lead, the monarch, the majesty, the important and the everything is love. It's better than any gift. And any gift that does not flow from love is no gift from God at all. It's no gift at all. I don't really care what it does, what kind of crowd it draws, how much money it puts into the coffers of the church. If it doesn't flow from love, bring people to love, then it is not of God. And so that's what chapter 13, as we set up for that next week, is going to be all about, is that we need to find find the foundation. And if the church in Corinth would keep that foundation, in big word, if, then they would have had none of these divisions. They would have none of these confusions of the culture creeping into the church. Love is is the majesty. And God has identified himself as love. And he showed his love for each one of us at the cross. 
And so, Lord, I'm so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful, God, for the uh, unsearchable wisdom that we find, Lord, when we seek you. And I pray, Father, as these folks leave out of here, that your grace would be upon them, that you would guide them by your spirit, guide me by your spirit, Lord, this week, Father, um, as we seek to glorify you, um, that we would be awake into a life uh, that is uh, seeking to honor you and, and bring you glory. If you, if you today um, need to come to the Lord, we're available. We would like to bring you to Jesus. I'm not going to talk you into it. I shouldn't have to. If Jesus has called you to himself and you've never accepted him, accept him right now. Come to the Lord and we're here to receive you unto the Lord and to pray with you. Um, and I pray that today if you're caught up in some sort of conditional lifestyle and it's conditioned upon everything that goes on around you, then listen, you're living in a state of uh, deformity. And God has made a way for you and I to be people of integrity, people of character, unconditional existence. You just give everything. If you like today's message or were blessed by it, be sure to like and subscribe now and become part of our community. Also, help spread the great news of Jesus Christ by sharing this message on your social media accounts like Facebook, Instagram, so that your friends and family can be blessed as well.